I want to start out this morning by telling you guys a story about a pastor or friend of mine. He um, tells a story of a girl that he went to high school who was maybe two years older than he was. And when this girl turned 17 years old, she was in high school and she got pregnant. And he tells me that the town they lived in was pretty small and the church they went to wasn't that big of a church. So news of the pregnancy, of course, um, like in most small towns, something like that, it spread relatively fast. And for a while, she kept coming to church, even though she was showing just a little bit. But some of the parents had a problem with this because, see, they didn't want their kids to be around a 17-year-old who was pregnant, like it was COVID or a disease or something, like they were going to catch it. But they just didn't want their kids around this young lady at all. And he says that he remembered one Sunday morning sitting in the sanctuary and there were two moms that were sitting in the pew right in front of him. And this girl, to the, at this point, she was quite pregnant now. So she walks in and uh, she sits down into the sanctuary and one of the moms said to the other mom, you know, I can't believe she would come in here in that condition. I can't believe that she would come to God's house in that condition. And he said that he didn't remember seeing her come back after that Sunday. And so my friend most recently ran across this young lady on Facebook. And on Facebook, there is an information page where you can find out just a little bit about the person that maybe that you have lost track keeping up with. And... Uh, there is one section where you can list your favorite quotes. And one of the quotes this young lady posted said this, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And when I heard this, it reminded me of the, it reminded me of the story in John chapter 8, which is a very familiar story. And when I start to read through it, you will remember it. But... What I want us to look at this morning is we're in this series called I Want God. This morning I want us to look at I want God more than I want religion. I want God, I want that relationship with Christ more than I just want religion. So let's jump into John chapter 8. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. But Jesus, he went to the Mount of Olives and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts. Where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who was caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. I'm going to stop right there. There are still churches today. If you are in their church and you are caught in sin, they will make you stand before the congregation. I know of a church right now in North Carolina that does that. I'm going to tell you, we're all in sin. I would not be going to that church for nothing. Because I'd probably be standing up there every Sunday. And amen. When the altar would be crowded every Sunday, wouldn't it? So let me, let me jump back in here. It said, they made her stand before the group. And Jesus said to her, and Jesus said, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? See, they were using this question in verse 6 as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus, he bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he went right back down. On his knee, and he started writing in the sand with his finger. And at this, those who heard him began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman, the woman standing there. And Jesus straightened up, and he asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus said. Go now and leave your life of sin. So I want to break down this scripture that I just read to you this morning. We read about Jesus 
He's just in the courtyard one morning teaching, just sitting there teaching. And an angry mob burst onto the scene made up of religious leaders, made up of maybe the two moms who were like, oh, why would she be coming to church in her state? People like that. And in the middle of them, they were angrily pushing a woman. Now, I'm going to tell you, as a man, that would have made me mad to start with because you don't lay your hand on a woman. And they're pushing her. So I'm sure Jesus, because he was man and he was God. And I'm sure that was the first thing that probably got him to the level he needed to be at to deal with them. So they shove her to the ground and she just happens to fall where? At his feet. And they said, we caught this woman in the act of adultery and the law says we stone her. What do you say? See, they are using the law to try to trap Jesus. And you know what, church? Rules can do the same to you and me. I've met many people within church who are trapped because of the rules, who are trapped because of the legalism, who are trapped because of the pharisaical ideology that they have of how things should be instead of how they need to be. It says, we may not parade a sinner around town, but we'll huddle in whispering circles and we'll name drop to everyone. But I want you to understand, God's word provides both guidance and commandments. And these commandments, those laws are here to protect us. Yet when we overemphasize following the rules, we can get people thinking we've got it all figured out. We can get people thinking they shouldn't share their struggles with us because we're perfect. So in my other job, I'm around a lot of people. I'm around a lot of people who are not believers. Now, the guys that I kind of oversee, it's so funny. There's, there's four of them. And every time they let a word slip, they apologize to me. Every time. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. And I look at him and say, no, I don't care if you're standing before me or you're standing before anybody. You shouldn't say that. Because they've, they've looked at me and they've said, you know, he, he's not like me. And in some ways, I hate it when they say that to me because I think they're putting me on a pedestal. And I don't want to be put on a pedestal to them. Because how am I, gonna, how am I ever going to tell them about Jesus if I don't build a relationship with them? If I'm up here... And they're down here, and I speak to them up here, and they're down here. How are we ever going to come together? We're not going to come together if that's the case. And that's what I want us to address this morning. Sometimes certain Christians can be a lot more like the Pharisees and the religious leaders than, than like the Messiah. And they end up using the rules to rationalize how they treat others within the church. I was in a church one time preaching, and they honestly thought you could not hear the gospel plainly if the pastor had jeans on. <laughs> this is a church about 30 minutes from here. I'm not joking with you. You can't. You can't. No, we don't even understand what you're saying because we can't get past how you look. Aren't you glad Jesus got past how we look? Aren't you glad me and your wife got past how you look? Because if she didn't, you might not be married. But think about that for a second. We get so hung up on the rules. And you know, that, that first song that you did this morning, that's a relatively modern worship song. And then you followed it up with a hymn, which was, which, which was a mixture, which was good. You know, and I don't think anybody in here would go, well, that's just not church because there was a guitar on the stage. And they sang like a modern worship song. You know what? I got just as much out of the first song as I did the second song. And you know what? We all know people like that. We all know people like that. But what do we have to do as believers? We have to continue to love. We have to continue to show God's grace even to people like that. So if you want to come to God, then you've got to follow all the rules that we've established just to make sure that only the people who are really serious get in. That's what the religious leaders say. So we're going to look at three things this morning. Rules, they can be cumbersome. For example, 
I grew up in a Christian school. From kindergarten to fifth grade, I went to public school six through eight, and then ninth through twelve, I went back to the Christian school. So I go to this Christian school. Um, now, please understand, they had every right to have the, the, the rules and the regulations that they had. They were, a, they were a private school. They were not governed by the state, so they could do what they wanted. And it was a great school. But they had stuff like my hair couldn't touch my collar. Well, I guess that was stuff, look. Because yeah, I still I don't like my hair to touch my collar. And your hair had to be up over your ears. That's just how they wanted it. Now, the girls' skirts had to basically be to their knee or below. To their knee or below. And that was basically the standard for how they wanted the girls to dress. Um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, the guys had to wear a tie for chapel. Which I think that is still a lot in me because I still love wearing ties today. I do. I don't get to wear them a whole lot. But I love wearing them and I think that's where it came from. Um, on away ball games, the guys sat in the front of the bus. So the girls sat in the back of the bus. Now can I just tell y'all something? You promise not to get real crazy on me. I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> My first kiss was on one of those, one of the, the school's buses coming back from the ball game. Now, wait a minute. It was mixed. I mean, I wasn't in the front. <laughs> wait, I needed to preface that a little bit. So, for some reason, they were letting the guys and the girls all sit together. So, it didn't want to kiss. It was just like a kiss. It was nothing crazy. So, uh, y'all did not even need to know that. Um, Gracious. The boys had to wear collared shirts. There were no t-shirts. Every time we were at school, we had to wear a collared shirt. Girls had certain rules about makeup and about jewelry, about what they could wear and what they could not wear. And again, you know, it's fine for schools and it's fine for, for families to have these rules. But here's what happened to a lot of the kids that I went to school with. They associated the rules not with school, but with Jesus. Can you see how that would work? They didn't associate that with Christian school. They associated that with, well, if Jesus is going to love me, my hair can't touch my collar. Or if Jesus is going to love me, my dress can't be above my knees. And I look at that, and many of them got the message that these are the rules that you've got to follow if you're really going to be a Christian. And when they graduated from high school, many of them walked away. And even today, they're still away. Because of the damage that was done at the Christian school. Or look at a church. Or at a Christian church. So they were exhausted from trying to keep all the rules. And the problem is that they had somehow gotten the idea that following those rules made them a Christian. Just like this woman in John 8. She's looking down. She's humiliated. She's guilty. And she is ashamed. How many of you have ever felt that way? I think all of us probably have, haven't we? And she's been caught breaking the rules. It was not like a private sin. She was caught in the act of adultery. And they caught her. And this may be the day that breaking a rule cost her everything. Because now she is before Jesus. Jesus calmly and quietly, he kneels down and he begins to write something in the sand. And you know what? We don't know what he was writing because the Bible doesn't tell us. But could it be that maybe Jesus was in the sand and he was writing the name of one of the Pharisees and he said, abuser. And maybe he wrote the name of another of the Pharisees and he said, adulterer. Or a liar. Or gossip. Because what did we see happen? When he was riding in the sand, they started to walk away. He knew. He knew what he was talking about. And they knew that he had their number. And so Jesus, when he calmly kneels and he begins to write, what he's doing is he's showing. He is showing this lady that was called in adultery. You're not alone. You're not alone in your sin. Because who knows, maybe this lady was looking and she was seeing. Maybe she was the only one who was seeing what Jesus was writing. And maybe he was writing it to make her understand that those who were accusing her were not perfect. Meanwhile, the religious leaders, 
They waited for an answer. See, they know that they have caught Jesus by surprise. So they thought they are waiting for him to shrug his shoulders and say, well, those are the rules and we've got to live by the rules. And finally, Jesus looks at these spiritual leaders and what he says, it nails them right between the eyes in verse 7. It says, if any one of you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. One by one, the bullies, they drop their stones and they walk away. And Jesus is left alone with this woman. And then Jesus asks her a question. Is there anyone to condemn you? And she was probably thinking, yes, you're the Savior of the world and you're going to condemn me. There is no one higher. And then Jesus says with tenderness, neither do I condemn you. So you go now and you leave your life of sin. And this is exactly what Jesus is saying to some of us sitting in this room this morning. I don't condemn you. The only thing I want you to do is go and sin no more. How many of you, how many of you, Feel guilty like a lot in your life because maybe of your lifestyle or maybe of your past and you carry that around in a suitcase and you drag it and it gets heavier and heavier and heavier every day. And Jesus, he is basically just saying, go now and leave your life of sin. Because there's a reason when you get in your car and that thing that's up on the glass on the windshield, what's it called? What's it called? A mirror. What kind of mirror? Rear view. Rear view. Where are you looking? You're looking behind you. Why is the windshield so much bigger than the rear view mirror? Why? Because that's where our focus needs to be. Not just on driving, but also in walking in our spiritual life with Christ. He wants us to see everything he has for us. And so... Sometimes the rules can become cumbersome, but the second thing, the rules don't inspire. They don't inspire grace. I remember I was taking a test in high school when the teacher handed out the test and specifically said, read the entire test before you begin to take it. And when I got to the end of the multiple page test, I read these words at the bottom of the page. You can try and get an A by taking the test, or you can simply put your name on the paper and get an A. That's all you got to do. Just put your name on the paper. What she was doing is she was trying to get us to read the instructions. And then there was this one young lady in my class. Her name, I don't remember her last name. Her, name, her first name was Paige. And she got out and she was quite upset that she had spent so much time studying this test. And she says, what kind of teacher would give an A for nothing? I said, our teacher. No, no offense. <laughs> My wife is an art teacher, and I tell her all the time, it's like, all you do is color. And she's like, no, I don't. I do so much more. But what kind of teacher would give an A for nothing? And I understand that she stayed up, and it was the principle of the matter. She studied. And if she was going to get an A, she was going to earn it. And you know what? A fan of Jesus says this. I'm not taking any handouts. I'm not. I can do this on my own. And so fans of Jesus spend their lives carrying around the burden, the burden of religion. And the grace of Jesus, the same grace that saved this woman from being stoned, calls to those who have been carrying around a long list of rules and rituals and says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Do you think this young lady was weary and burdened? Come on now. And I'm going to tell you right now, sin will make you weary and burdened. I don't care what kind of sin it is. It will tear you down. It will make you weary. It will stress you out. And maybe, just maybe, some of us grew up in a home where we were taught all about Jesus. I, I did. I grew up in that home. And we went to church, like I told you, every single time the doors were open, went to every summer camp, went to you know, we learned what the fear of God was. We, we understood that we understood, the, the, we understood the, the, the Ten Commandments, if you will, the rules, the commandments. And we understood the laws of Jesus and what he said to us, hoping, hoping as a child that if I understood this stuff and I memorized the Ten Commandments, it was going to keep me out of hell. That was my mentality. That was my mentality. But somehow, but somehow... 
as I told you a couple weeks ago, it wasn't until college that I think I really fell in love with Jesus. Knew about him my whole life. Understood who he was. Prayed to him. Sang to him. Listened to preachers preach about him. But did I know him? I didn't know him. See, it's, it's, it's kind of like when it's kind of like when you're dating someone and they lay down the disclaimer. And they look at you and say, look, you're dating me now exclusively. So you cannot talk to the opposite sex. Some of laugh. You can't even talk to the opposite sex. You have to let me know exactly where you're going all the time. You will be available 24-7 if I need to reach you. Do you understand? You're not sitting here thinking this is me, are you, Jenny? <laughs> You're not, are you? You're not. I hope not. We will do what I want to do, and basically you have no say. Now, tell me, what would happen if you were dating, or maybe you dated something like that, and they said that to you? Yeah. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> See ya. I'm out of here. We're not doing this. This is a little bit crazy. But when I got married, there were some rules that I said I would have to live by. Some of them written and some of them unwritten. But I understood when I said I do that I would love my wife as long as we were both alive. Until death do us part. I would provide for her. I would meet her needs. And I would be committed to her for better or for worse. And these are the other rules that I didn't know about that have since been established since the I do. I know my limits when I'm picking on her. I love to pick. I grew up picking. My other, my big son over there in the boots, he loves to pick too. And he gets on my nerves and annoys me. But I can't get mad at him because he is me. He got it from me. But I love to pick on my wife. She was in my, and she was in the kitchen last night making a chicken pie. And I came in there and I was messing with her. And when she does her face like that, I know to stop it. I've learned that over 30 years. Men, am I telling the truth? Do you know when to leave your wife alone and give her some space? Okay. So, I also know that I'm to, I'm, 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 I'm to do my chores with my mask. Like, take out the trash. Get up and do it. And I have to tell her what I'm feeling and not hold my feelings back because I don't know how you are. But sometimes when I get angry with my wife, I don't, I don't just go, can we just talk this through, please? I don't want to talk to her. I want to get in my truck, go get my fishing rod and my guy and go fishing. That's what I want to do. I just want to get away from her. And if she wants to do the same with me. I understand that. But I have learned over the years that if I just sit down, and sometimes it's so hard. And do you know why it's so hard? Because it's that huge P word that these men deal with, I deal with. It's pride. I'm showing my weakness if I look her in the eyes and go, let's talk. I, I don't want to do that. But I know that I have to do that. I know what's right. And if I saw our relationship as a bunch of rules I had to keep, I wouldn't be very happy now, would I? But because I love my wife, and I find joy in being a good husband, I would do anything for her. And so doing the dishes, or putting the lid down on the toilet, or other extravagant acts of sacrifice are a joy for me most of the time. And in the end, the grace and the love of God frees us and it inspires us to live for Him. It's so much easier in my house when I listen. Some of you men are going, man, you must stop. No, I'm serious. It is just so much easier that I found out if I listen. And I get along with my spouse so much better. And I'm equating this to the rules that we look at in church. And how we can interpret those rules. See, in the end, the grace and love of God frees us and inspires us to live for Him. Our priority, our emphasis, and our focus has to be on a loving God. And it has to be about a relationship with Jesus not a list of rules, not a list of regulations. Otherwise, it won't work. And that brings us to the last and final thing. The rules don't keep us around. See, I want to say this very cautiously and very carefully and clearly. When our kids grow up and they define Christianity, 
as keeping a moral code. Did you catch that? As Christianity as keeping a moral code instead of defining Christianity as being a follower of Jesus and having a relationship with him, nine times out of ten, they'll walk away from both. Because being a Christian is not just a moral code. Being a Christian is having a relationship with Jesus. And then the moral code follows second. And if you have the relationship you're supposed to have, you're going to want to live by what God tells you to live by. So often we think I've got to make sure that they understand these rules and these moral obligations of being a Christian. That's what we think about our children. And while that is true, I'm telling you, if they define Christianity that way, instead of defining Christianity as a follower of Jesus, they will walk away from both. They will walk away from Jesus and the moral code. And we must define Christianity first and foremost as the following of Jesus Christ, not the rules and regulations. So any wisdom that I can impart to parents here of young kids, point them to Jesus. Now, you've got to have rules in your house. you got to. But that relationship with Jesus, letting them see the picture in John 8 of a broken woman who had nowhere else to go, who was caught in sin, and Jesus is standing there. Paint that picture for your children, families, of a Jesus with his arms open. Tell your kids, mom and dad may fail you, but guess what? Your heavenly father never will. And then you can take them to Scripture, and you can show them a story just like this. And then they're going to go, what's adultery? You might not want to take them to this story. You may want to take them to another story. But there's stories everywhere in the Bible that shows Jesus with his arms open. Wide open. Saying, come, come to me. So, I want to close this morning by telling you a story. And um, when we moved to the coast of North Carolina in 2014 to plant a church... Um, there was, a, there was a guy who lived beside us and his wife, and he was rough. He was, like, super rough. His wife was super rough, and their names were Mike and Sandy. Well, I slowly began to build a relationship with Mike, and he told me that when he was first married, his wife was a church girl. And she would beg him and beg him and beg him to go to church. And he continued to tell her, you know, I, I, I don't want to do this. I don't need to do this. So he finally decided, you know what, to get her to quit nagging me, I'm going to go to church with her. So he goes to church. Goes to church a couple times, and he likes it. He likes it. And then the pastor talked to him, and he said, you know, would you? we're doing baptisms in a couple weeks. Would you be interested in becoming a Christian and being baptized? And Mike was like, I think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to do this. So Mike goes to that church that morning to get baptized. <clears throat> and as he is in the baptismal pool in front of the entire congregation, the pastor says what he has to say. And he goes to put Mike under. And for some reason, the power shorted out in the church when that happened. The pastor drops him, lets go of him, and just told him, he said, you're... You're too gone. You're too far gone for Jesus. Because that was a sign God just gave us. You don't need to be here. You need to get out of our church. <laughs> Never been to church again. Never been to church again. Because of that experience. Because, see, it was all about the rules. It was all about the regulations. It was all about them perceiving what he was when they really didn't know his heart. God knew his heart. So we invited him to our church. I said, okay, Mike, I've known you for a while now. You're rough. I know you're rough. Your wife's rough. But we really like you. And we want you to come to church. So they walked into our church. And most everybody's dressed like my brother right back here. A pair of shorts, golf shirt, flip-flops, whatever. Just because we let people come as they were. I didn't have a suit on. And so I just, I would, he would come and... And I would preach. I would just preach. And slowly but surely, that bad experience that they had started to fade away. Because you know what happened? They started to see a Jesus 
that this lady saw in John 8. They started to see a Jesus that bent down and said, you know what? I'll never drop you in baptism. You know what? I don't care how rough you are, how many times you've been married, what kind of sin you've got in your life. I love you. But this is what I want to tell you. I want to tell you to go and sin no more. That's the command that I've given you today. And long story short, um, they actually both received Christ at the church, which was a massive blessing. And then probably a year later, his wife passed away in her sleep. Just, just passed away. And they still are not sure why. But I remember him calling me and, um, and you know, broken. Oh, my goodness. Went and sat with him. Broken, broken, broken. And the way I look at it, had they stayed in the church they were in, neither one of them would have never known Jesus. And when Sandy passed away, she would have never went to heaven. But you know the beauty in it? I was able to look at Mike and say, guess what? You're going to see her again. You know why you're going to see her again? Because both of you gave your lives to Jesus. And it was simple. And... I look, I look at John 3, 17, and it says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So I would ask you this morning, the people that God has put around you, how are you looking at them? What lens are you looking through at them? Is it a judgmental lens? Is it a condemning lens? Or is it a lens of God made you just like he made me. God loves you just as much as he loves me. And I just want to share Jesus with you. I saw a quote this week by uh, a pastor. And his name is Craig Rochelle. And this is what it said. When you are ready to quit, try to remember. It takes a death to have a resurrection. It takes pain to have progress. It takes hurt to have healing. And it takes a struggle to have a story worth telling. And it takes a trial to have a testimony. And, and I knew what I was preaching about today. And I'm looking at that. This woman died that day. Her, every bit of her pride, any pride that she had, died that day. Because she got called out. And the pain, can you imagine the pain that she had not just been through that day, but what she had been through prior. If she was caught in the act of adultery, I'm sure the lifestyle was one of promiscuity and probably not good. So she was probably living a life of pain. It takes hurt to have a healing. The hurt. She had to walk through the hurt before she could get to the healing. It takes a struggle to have a story worth telling. Can you imagine the story she could tell when she got up and she walked out of there? Everybody in town knew who she was, I'm sure. But she can now say, Jesus touched me and made me whole. Something wonderful happened and all I know is that he touched me and he made me whole. And then it takes a trial to have a testimony, to be able to go out. And to tell others, this is where I was. But guess what? I'm not there anymore. I'm not there anymore because Jesus knelt down and he touched me. And this morning, that's what he's doing in this place. Some of you have walked in here today. And maybe your sin is not like what we read about the lady in John 8 this morning. Maybe your sin is totally something different. But you're carrying that sin day in and day out. You've tried to get past it, and you can't. And church, you're not going to be able to do it on your own. You have got to be able to have the humbleness to kneel before God and say, I need you. I need you, God. And then when you do that, this is what happens. That is when your life, your soul, your spirit, your flesh, is resurrected for Jesus.
just like this lady in John 8. So I would encourage you this morning, if you walked in here carrying something, you are not here for, by accident. You did, not, you did not show up in this building today by accident. God brought you here for a purpose. And if you're walking through something this morning, during the time of invitation when we sing, I would encourage you just to come and leave it right here on this altar. Just come and kneel. Who cares what anybody thinks? Who cares? Let them talk. If they want to talk, let them talk. They don't know nothing about you. It's between you and Jesus. You will never be as humiliated as this woman was. Think about that for a second. And people get so scared about walking an aisle and kneeling at an altar. Man, I'm going to tell you, there are sometimes I'm in church, I can't wait for the preacher to shut up so I can get to the altar. I've been in church services before when people have got up during the sermon and went to the altar. Because the Spirit was moving so thick that they wanted to just be with Jesus. So, I encourage you this morning, whatever you're carrying, whatever you're carrying, don't carry it out of here. You carried it in. Leave it here. Or maybe you've walked in here today and you're like, that Jesus that you're talking about, that's what I need. That's what I need. I thought I knew him. My mom knew him, my daddy knew him, my grandparents knew him, but I don't have a personal relationship with him. And so what we're gonna do this morning as we close and before we sing, if that is you this morning and you need to, you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we're just gonna bow our heads. And we're going to pray. And if that's you, I would just want you to pray that prayer to him this morning. Right where you sit. And the beauty of salvation is it's instantaneously. It ain't like a credit check. When you're trying to get a house and you got to wait four months to see if your credit's any good. When you meet Jesus, he invades you immediately. And he washes you clean. All the junk, all the trash, all the dirt, all the past is gone. And you have a new tenant living in your heart. It's not Satan anymore. It's Jesus. So if that's you this morning and you need to receive him, I ask you just to bow your heads and say this prayer with me. God, I am a sinner. I am sorry for my sin. I ask you to forgive me of my sin today. Jesus, come into my life. Wash me whiter than snow. Take up residence in my soul. And be the king of my life today. And if you prayed that prayer this morning, I would want you to share with either myself or one of the deacons or one of the leaders at this church because that is a prayer of celebration. And God, I thank you that, I thank you, God, that you're simple. That we can sit in a room today, God, and we can just ask you to come into our hearts and you do. We don't have to go through rules and regulations and classes and schooling and all this to meet you, God. All we have to do is ask, and then you just come into our heart, God. And I thank you for that simplicity. And I thank you for, if anyone here prayed that prayer this morning, God, thank you for their boldness. And I pray for the next step of their boldness, that they would share that with someone today. And God, for the people in here that are, that are carrying sin today, God, like a large amount, an overload of sin, God, like this woman was in John 8. Give them the boldness when we sing, God, to slip out. To come to this altar, God, and just to lay it down. Never to pick it up again, God. Touch them, heal them, change them. Make them new, Father. Make them a new creation today. Just as you did this woman in John 8. God, you're so good. And God, I thank you for the opportunity, God, just to, God, just to share your word with your people today. It's such an honor to stand before you today, God. Now you do what only you can do in this time of invitation.